Happy summer, everybody. Peace, peace, peace. What's up? It's Randomly Selected. I'm Mario. On today's program, Dr. Amara Anya joins us to talk about a lot of stuff, including walking me over a bridge. But that's not why you called. I wonder, hey, Amara, did you learn anything from that run, that last run when you ran with all 150 other people running for mayor? I mean, there was so much that I learned um, in that experience. I think a couple of things. One is I'm glad that, you know, just learning the importance of sticking to your values and sticking to a core set of values that are based upon integrity and character. Because when you go through that kind of endeavor, you know, we, someone like me or a candidate like myself would get it from all sides. Mm -hmm. One, I did not come with the, the, pedigree of what someone involved in politics in Chicago would have. So I was not backed by a machine. I didn't have a lot of money. I live on the west side of Chicago. I'm not, I was not um, wealthy in terms of the financial sense um, and was not politically connected to a machine of any sort. Mm -hmm. And so when a decision to run for mayor without having those so-called qualifications means that you're going to face incredible opposition um, Chicago, because of the politics, is such a, there's a, a cynicism that exists. And, and you know, there's a reason behind it because of the history of the city and issues of corruption and so on and so forth. But what I learned is that that cynicism is so deeply rooted that there are pre-existing narratives that, that they will try to put you in <laughs> to fulfill. <laughs> pre-existing conditions, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Um, so you don't, so it's really important, one, to know who you are before you get into any kind of endeavor like this. And that's something that I'm glad and thankful really for my parents for instilling a strong sense of self, but also to not cave into the messiness and the, and the dirtiness and the darkness of politics. I mean, there were so many times where I could, could justifiably have gone in both during the campaign and after the things that I know I could be like Kwame Brown mm. like <laughs> like Kwame mm. Brown and just because of the things that I know <laughs> mm. that folks don't even know how much I know yeah. and could justifiably have you know put people on blast and lashed out but you know it's about having just being having good character and integrity and sticking to those values and not caving into mudslinging or all of those negative things yeah. and so Coming out of it, I was glad looking back, whether I'm sitting in the seat or not, that I did not compromise my values or integrity or cave into the messiness and the darkest parts of Chicago politics. Do you ever think, man, if I was mayor today, dot, 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 that ever come through your, <laughs> across your mind? Well, I mean, I, I, I hmm. Because it would make it seem like, if you were, I mean, even having that thought, I guess, leads you to, to, to having the desire to be mayor again. Is that <laughs> OK? Well, I mean, you know, I, I truly believe that everything turned out exactly how it was supposed to. Right. And I'm very, very sure of that. Yeah. My commitment and my responsibility was when at the point of deciding to run was to do the absolute best that I could and put everything into it. And I did. And mm -hmm. then some. Mm -hmm. So I think the outcome was how it was supposed to how it was supposed to go. Now I look I look at what's happening. And of course, there there are times where I think I, this could have been handled so differently or the, there are so many missed opportunities or this didn't have to be this way yeah. on a number of things that have happened over the last couple of years, but I've never thought, I've never felt a sense of, oh, if only I had won or, oh, I wish I had won. I, I feel very peaceful mm. about the outcome, mm. um, but still able to, to reflect critically on how the last couple of years has gone. I remember us talking a while back, um, actually after the election, um, and you made it a point of saying, that you were at peace with everything and you were at peace with the decision. And I wasn't. <laughs> and, I, and I think I look back at, 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 there were like 13 people running for mayor. 14, and I think it started out with like 21. It was tw right. <laughs> I mean, the playing field was already slanted in, in many ways. Yeah. And it just, you know, I don't know. I, I wanna ask you about the Chicago Tribune. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm doing the hard, heavy stuff first. I want to <laughs> ask you about the Tribune because there's a consensus among a lot of people that part of the reason that this wasn't as, as successful a run as it should have been was because of the work that the Chicago Tribune put <laughs> into trying to get so many people out of that race. Yeah. Not just you, but Vallis and and for the folks who are listening who aren't from Chicago, there were when I say it was a clown car of people <laughs> running for mayor, not clowns, just a clown car full of people running for mayor, it really was. Um, if, I don't want to use the word animosity, but the Tribune was really pointed in in trying to slow people down and and it, and, and it 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 was noticeable how did that sit with you well you know i thought <laughs> i thought that you know i can say it now it was actually laughable at mm. times i would just actually laugh to myself because it was so over the top it just was bizarre um so we already know that the media, like I always, I come out of, I have a journalism background, so mm -hmm. I kind of know how, how it goes. But I think, you know, Chicago, the media, I was very underwhelmed and unimpressed, frankly, by the type of coverage. And so I talked earlier about how there are these pre-existing narratives that they kind of just backfill. Yeah. And that was sort of what it seemed like. You have to have the corrupt one. Someone has to be doing something shady. Then you have to have the person. And so when you actually read the articles, especially the ones related to myself, I just kind of laughed. And it was like, who are they even talking about? I mean, mm. they, it, there was absolutely no effort to really objectively report on things. It was, it was very, there were even instances where it felt juvenile. Mm. Um, like, are you actually professionals doing a job? And also this question of the representation in media, because some of the independent outlets and some of the black media outlets, you, you could actually see that they were trying to humanize and get to the, the characters and the personalities of the candidates. Whereas if, when you looked at mainstream media, Tribune included, it was... It was kind of un unimpressive. It mm. was the usual Chicago politics narratives that they already had lined up. And all they did was try to find information that would reinforce the narrative. Yeah. So while it was, I definitely took some hits in the press. And, you know, obviously it's never fun. But I knew enough not to, I didn't take it personally. But also I just, like I said, I just kind of laugh to myself sometimes. I read the articles and like, you all are really just not really good at what you're doing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and when the campaign is over, you know, it's going to be over and I'm going to move on. But you all are going to really have to think about how you contribute to the cynicism and the darkest parts of our politics. You yeah. don't get to where we are in Chicago without having a media that's just not uh, up to a certain standard. Why are we in this city? Your your observation of Chicago is pretty keen why are we where we are right now with violence and and uh particularly violence against children uh yeah. being caught in the middle of a real or perceived turf war right now why isn't there something that can be done is that is that on is that on the city to do is that on black folks to do is it on latinos to fix is who is this wh who takes the weight for all of this violence right now in chicago and just a general nature and vibration in the city well it's on, it's on everybody i mean we all have a responsibility every community has a responsibility i mean because we we live in our neighborhoods yeah. so you cannot live in the neighborhood and then completely divest from responsibility for what's happening in our neighborhoods what i've always been very clear about is from the city perspective there is a responsibility for the city to actually address some of the conditions that were perpetuated by the city mm -hmm. so when you think about public policy a lot of the challenges that we're facing economically for example are directly related to the city's failure to invest in certain communities with intention mm -hmm. so i don't talk about government and asking for things and you know no i talk about what communities are entitled to i talk about what if you look at black neighborhoods what they're entitled to so this isn't about asking for extra or handouts it's about there are certain areas of the city that have gotten the largesse yeah. of this city's wealth and then there are other communities that have been intentionally deprived 
of that largesse. And so that's a responsibility on the city and it's related to economic investment, it's related to education, um, it's related to housing access, it's related to um, environmental injustices. Those are decisions that come straight out of the administration, out of City Hall. So the responsibility is there. Yes, there's responsibility on the part of the community, but the city is also, there's some responsibility there that we have to con continuously call out if we're going to materially change the conditions of people's lives. Welcome back, everybody, to Randomly Selected. I, I, I hope you didn't leave. You need to hang out through this whole episode. We're talking to a Dr. Amara Enya. Dr. Enya walked your boy across a bridge. Not a theoretical bridge, an actual bridge, the Michigan Avenue Bridge here in Chicago. And uh, only a person with an enlightened spirit would do that. Hey, you know, I wonder how she reached this level of enlightenment. Let's find out. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I got to do it, and but, but you just jump in whenever. Of course. So a few years back, a uh, good friend of you and I, and, and most folks, Justin Kaufman, the man, uh, was hosting a show on WGN Radio. You and I were regulars on the show. You're yes. my radio wife, for yes. those that don't know. <laughs> and it was time to leave, and you go, it was his last show on GN. Yep. And you go, you know what, it's a nice night. Let's walk across the, the bridge. Now, what, another fact about me you don't know, I'm afraid of walking across bridges. I'm like horrified. Deathly afraid. It's not even funny. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, we're going to walk across. And I like looked at her. I'm like, you crazy? I'm not walking across that bridge. Michigan Avenue Bridge. Everyone walks across the Michigan. It's not a big deal. It is a big deal. She walked me across the bridge. You, you. We walked across together. So I, I held his hand. It was like a vice grip <laughs> on my hand. It's but so I was able to withstand it's the so agony until so, we were able let, to let's just be clear though your definition of agony <laughs> is my definition of survival <laughs> it was really important that yeah. i saved my life oh my goodness i was not going to let anything happen to you and i told you that at that time yes you did and you know what made it made, what made it easy is that you turned on your your amara on me you got all your voice got all low and you started looking at me in my eyes i i can't even look at you in the face <laughs> And I was like, this is not going to end well. <laughs> and you got me across the bridge. Yes. And it was successful. And it was a wonderful, peaceful evening. Yeah, and you well. conquered a fear. And that's what counts. Yeah, but still don't walk across that bridge. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I, oh, no. If, we'll if see. it's a cab available, I'm taking it. <laughs> um, I am The thing I think people like about you the most, uh, once they get to know you, is that you have a spirit that is very much, um, we use the word informed around here a lot, informed by your enlightenment. Mm. Where did that come from? <laughs> the spirit of the enlightenment. <laughs> Either or. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think um, I've always been a very observant so I'm, I'm i'm actually much more of an insular type of just i just like to be back in the cut observing things yeah. I'm, I'm i've always been that way yeah. um so i've never been you know out there out you know extroverted but just very um actually quiet and observant because there's there's things that you notice just by sitting back and watching. And so I've always been that type. And, you know, some people say, you know, in your head, mm -hmm. I guess. And I, mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> and that's been a, a phrase that people have used to describe me too. Um, just, you know, and always kind of being a little bit odd in a sense. Yeah. Um, even with, just growing up, not really fitting into any kind of boxes ever, but being, becoming comfortable with that ultimately is is it important for you to be part of the narrative of chicago or is it ha, are you over it <laughs> this is not me asking you if you're running for mayor yet Sorry. but i'm just saying because i mean you look you look at stacy abrams in georgia you look at kamala harris she's the vice president of the united states you look at all these women black women women in general who are who are emerging 
politically and so, and socially and speaking of how the country looks, how cities in our country look. And this is important work. And you keep doing the work. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm Chicago specific is the narrative is, is your voice, your name being part of the narrative, something that's important to you. Or are you like, hey, it's, it's fine? Yeah, it's um, I don't think it is. I think for me, it's the output. Mm. It's really about what am I doing with my skills and my gifts and my talents? And a lot of times, even before I ran for office, I was doing a lot of the same work, but you know, it was just not, it's not going to be in the news. It's not going to be announced or anything like that. And I actually prefer that. Like I'm not a very need to be out there in the public eye type person. Mm-hmm. I'm also a person who just believes in, um, purpose and purpose is not necessarily tied to a particular position Mm -hmm. so whatever Mm -hmm. gifts that i have they could have they could be excellent as mayor but they could also be excellent in any other role because as a person you come you you come with your gifts and you take them with you in whatever capacity and so i've i've never been the type of woman that's wanted to be an elected official i don't really care i don't care about being in the in crowd or having my name along with other politicos. I don't need external validation. I don't need to be validated really by anyone or anything besides my parents and, right. you know, right. maybe my siblings. Right. And so that's caused me to not sort of go the traditional route that a lot of folks expect of people who run for office. So the whole na- notion of run for any position that's open just so you can get elected to something. Mm, no. So it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not politician first with you. No, I know that about you. <laughs> um, but uh, your name keeps coming up. <laughs> people keep bringing your name up. It's, it's not, I'm not just blowing smoke. You know that people keep bringing your name. Your name keeps coming up in conversations revolving the city, the, the potential of being mayor of Chicago, uh, just your voice and the importance of it. It seems like that might be hard to run from. Not that you're running, but that just yeah. is like if, if they keep talking about you and you're saying, I'm not trying to do all that, but they're like, we need you to think more about doing it. Yeah. Doesn't that get to be like, yo, you know, give me give me some give me a little room. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. I, I think I'm always open to wherever my journey takes me. So I know like when I ran for office, the first the first time, and even most recently, it was an internal decision. It was, mm. a, it was a gut feeling that I had specifically about running for mayor mm-hmm. that I knew internally. And again, that's knowing that I didn't have the so-called political pedigree of yeah. an expected candidate. No one was encouraging me. There was no union or <laughs> millionaires backing me up. But I was convinced because I had a feeling that this was what I was supposed to do. And so I did it against a lot of, you know, naysayers and people who were like what are you doing and so even as my name may come up in a lot of conversations that's not to say that i'm you know running away Mm. but it's to say that that same process of internally knowing what my next moves are going to be and it's not driven by any external opinions or any um what other people's thoughts about how I should navigate because I've never operated that way. So to the extent that I can still be effective and impactful, I'm going to do whatever I can. And if I get that sense, that conviction that it's okay, it's politics again, or it's running for mayor or whatever, then I will do it. But knowing that it was an internal conviction means that I'm going to be able to do it to the fullest extent, just like the last election. Yeah. I put, I left everything, literally, and then some on the table in that election, and I can walk away from it at, with a level of peace, just complete peace, because I know that I did that, yeah. and I don't feel that, oh, if only I had, or maybe I should have, none of that. Why, well, not why, that's bad. You're a policy person. How how do you get some of the, the the things you saw for the city that could help South and West Side communities, that could help young people? Um, how do you get those things into the agenda of either the current mayor or the next mayors 
of this city? What 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 avenue is best? And not just you, but the community a, 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 at large. How do, how does that voice get amplified enough where people can feel comfortable saying to the fifth floor at City Hall, "Yo, look, there's a way to do this better. There's a way to do you know how how does that work?" Definitely by the relationships. I believe in building your own relationships that are productive. So I don't necessarily have to agree with somebody 100%, but we have to have, if we have an, a common area of interest, then yes, mm-hmm. let's, let's work to get that agenda passed. And so for me, it's, there's a lot of behind the scenes work. Like I think that information is necessary and can, people can be empowered by access to information so I don't necessarily need to be out front, but I will meet with folks behind the scenes and help them draft ordinances. Mm. I will explain um, budgetary issues to them. I will explain the inner workings of the in, of environmental justice issues and how to navigate because the city doesn't have a department yet. Like I will do those things because that helps them in their advocacy. And so it's a kind of a... Um, a background way of working that ensures that the people who are really doing the work have what they need to be effective. And for a lot of folks, you know, these are, again, these are, these are not the things that are happening at the press conferences and the, you know, yeah. the big shiny press conferences. It's just the behind the scenes work. And so you're the I, Clarence Avant. Of <laughs> Chicago. Except that's the hell of my hair. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but but I, I feel you. I'm always curious with you in particular about how you decompress because I know it gets to be heavy. There's a lot. Uh, and I know that you're a runner. Yes. And, and not in that sense, kids. I mean, she actually puts <laughs> gym shoes on and runs. Um, have you been to the Chicago Marathon? Yeah, that, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. You say like, come on, boy. Yeah, I've been a dog on <laughs> I don't run anywhere, so I don't know. <laughs> Running ain't my forte. Yeah. Um, you, you, uh, you, you, you're pretty good at it. You are really kind of crazy though, because you don't <laughs> run like a distance. You run like states. No, I, I don't really run states. Yeah, you I mean, do. I- <laughs> yes, you do. I know you do. Stop playing. No, I so I definitely run. I did my first marathon, Chicago Marathon, in back in two thousand eight. Oh, actually. Well, excuse me, professional. And- <laughs> what am I talking about? Um, I need to do better research. <laughs> I didn't no, know that. No, I mean, it, but it, it it was sort of the beginning of doing like endurance yeah um sports and stuff like that I mean, you're so. good at it though you know well we- i would say i'm consistent so i'm not winning anybody's marathon <laughs> but i for sure will finish yes, and i will. will you know i'll finish it by any means necessary right <laughs> and that's how i treat all my endurance events like i do biking i'm actually a, a pretty avid in fact i probably bike more than i run Silver Room, the Silver Room, everybody loves the Silver Room, 1506 East 53rd Street in Chicago, Illinois, right on Harper Avenue here in Hyde Park. And if you're outside of the Chicago area, you can go to thesilverroom.com, apparel, jewelry, music, live performances that you can see online, talkbacks with authors, designers, all kinds of stuff happens at the Silver Room, man. By the way, if you come into the Silver Room, masks are not required. However, they are heavily suggested. Wear your mask. Also, take care of yourselves while you're out here, especially if you're coming into the Silver Room, because we want you healthy and happy for all these cool events that are popping up in our store. The Silver Room, the Silver Room. Everybody loves the Silver Room. So I went to U of I, Urbana, oh, Champagne. Oh, look at you. Here we go now. Yes. Here we go. God. All the coolest people oh. went to U of I. Urbana Champagne. Hang in there, listeners. It happens for, every now and then. For the record. It's either Whitney Young or U of I. Well, yeah, You I mean, went to Whitney Young, too, didn't you? I certainly did not. Okay, good go for you. Yeah, no, I, I don't go back to high school because, like, high school. Yeah, I got you. I go back to undergrad. I, I did go to U of I. <laughs> I. I did the thing there, I think. The thing. Nice. The Let's thing. See. Nobody's listening. <laughs> you can say what the thing. I know what the thing is. <laughs> Everybody did the thing at U of I. <laughs> Um, do, 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 do you ever go back to that time and go, man, if I could have just not did this and did that? You know, no, because so I was 
So when I got to U of I, so I, my parents were very strict. So even when I was in college, oh the first couple of years, I had a curfew. What? Nine o'clock. At U of I? Yes. That's impossible. I know. It is because I'm not at home. <laughs> how did, they, how did they manage this? I don't know. But, you know, sometimes, see, the, the, the guilt, like, you just don't want to disappoint. Oh. But I also, <laughs> I, so I did not, I, so I had a good time freshman year but i had i did so well academically yeah that i was able to it was good it was a good balance because i had been you know studying and everything for the first 12 years of life and then when i got to u of i I was like oh oh there's what's all this going on Mm -hmm. man it Mm -hmm. was it was off the chain you were "Hmm." funny (laughs) i I can only imagine a young amara in your down in champagne urbana this wearing the world out down there <laughs> i was kind of a troublemaker i think <laughs> no. i didn't realize well not in the b- bad way depending on who you ask but a lot of the stuff that i'm doing now i was kind of you know stirring stuff up on campus as well this path has been laid for you for a long time yeah but i didn't notice it at the time yeah and i was kick doing so much kicking it that you know. <laughs> <laughs> see here we go Kicking it, huh? I can. Well, I I don't have to imagine that. I've kicked it with you on several occasions. Yes, but I still graduated with a stellar academic record and went on to do other things. So, with all that's been going on with our current mayor, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and the people in the city, the COVID restrictions, you're open again, you're closed again, you're open again, and how the city's being ran. I asked Dr. Enya, what does Chicago look like to her? not just during this administration, but past administrations. Oh, wait, maybe you run again? She ain't running again. Or is she running again? Before we wrap this up, um, to ask you what the future holds for you would be kind of, you know, that's not the question. (laughs) I think a better question is what do you see in the future? Not just for yourself, but for the city. What do you what do you think Chicago looks like past this administration into the next four, four eight years? Hmm. Well, to be honest, I am concerned because I think that there was and still is a true desire and a need to do things drastically in a drastically different way. And I almost, I feel like the last couple of years, even with COVID and with everything was an opportunity to really disrupt the status quo of Chicago um, and to go gangbusters and doing things just radically different. I mean, I'm talking about just taking a couple hundred million dollars and unrestricted putting it into those neighborhoods, not in the form of reimbursable grants and loans, but just for business ownership, for supporting uh, workforce training, for uh, training in the trades, all of that. With schools, we could have drastically just reimagined what education could and should look like in Chicago because we had the, the whole pandemic and everything that happened last year. There was the cover to do things in a really different way, to experiment. Mm-hmm. And I feel like instead, we just kind of dug our heels in, or the city dug its heels in to the same old. And that is a missed opportunity. Yeah. And so I'm concerned because I think that we, the city deserves change and deserves better. But because we, get caught up in just trifles and distractions and we lose the opportunity. So we'll get caught up in the symbolism and the optics Mm. and this person looks different. So we have this kind of mayor now just because of phenotype and, Mm. but the substance is the same. You had, you recreated the same mayor we've had for the last (laughs) 50 or 60 years with the exception of the years of Harold Washington. Yeah. I mean, we literally yeah. we create the same mayor. You, I don't know, you didn't, hear the, <laughs> you didn't hear the Lumpen show that night, but I said it that night. I was like, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Exactly. Yeah. And that's profoundly disappointing. 
I understand because yes, when there's 21 people and it's just hard to sort it out. But when you think about the issues, the issues in Chicago, we don't, we can't afford that. That same is why we're here now. Mm -hmm. And as we look at the rates of violence and we look at the population, particularly of black Chicago thinning out, um, and we look at it, there's a feeling of stagnation mm. that is that will be exacerbated to actual regression if we have the same kind of leadership in the next election or the next you know administration. And so I feel like people should be vigilant. And for the people of Chicago, like us, though we talk to people in our neighborhoods and. <clears throat> to not, to stop like getting distracted and, and wasting time kikiing about stupid stuff. Like that's what I've noticed. Like a lot of people spend so much time on, you know, on social media or just kind of kikiing and complaining about mm. just stupid stuff yeah. while the city is crumbling. Mm. And it's like, what are you all, do like what are we doing? So that's, if I'm honest, that's my concern, but that's also why I keep doing the work that I do. And I find other people who are doing the work and we link up and we work together and it's not going to be in the headlines and it's not, we're not looking to do press conferences and, and all that. We're just trying to do what we can do. Somebody, if, if there, if there turns out to be a front runner in this next election, I didn't mean to keep all this on the election, but it's just rather important right now sure. because Chicago's in a lot of trouble. It's in way more trouble than people will admit. Yep. If if there's a front runner, an, an obvious front runner and a challenger for Mayor Lightfoot to really be concerned about, and they come to you and say, listen, would you give your support to X against this current mayor? Is that something where, is that a decision you have to make or is that more like a yes, I will reflex action? Uh, on your part oh it totally depends on the person because you notice i didn't endorse anybody in the, Why <laughs> in the didn't you? because i knew who they were i mean <laughs> that ain't funny you know, <laughs> i mean it was <laughs> no because everybody was just kind of expecting because people were like oh we're gonna endorse this and that and you know, i knew to endorse you're attaching yourself and your values to a person and whatever they stand for. And because I knew when I, I was honest in my election, in my campaign about who the other characters were, I knew their strengths, I knew their weaknesses, and I knew that they were not aligned with my values. Mm. Um, and so for that reason, I just could not stomach the thought of just endorsing someone for what? Just to have endorsed, like I don't, again, I don't play into the whole, the way politics is supposed to happen. Everyone just expects you're gonna endorse this person and then, no, I'm going to do what speaks to me. And so it became very clear in the runoff, neither of these candidates were reflected the values that I spent the last year comp campaigning on. Right. So what I was not going to do was turn around and just endorse um, just because. And so for anyone who says, hey, I'm doing this and I want to, I have to think very long and hard about who they are, what their character is like, what their reputation is like, and not their public reputation, but your character. Mm -hmm. Because that's what's going to be the case before a campaign and after a campaign, you're still who you are. Yeah. So if your track record doesn't speak to something that I would feel comfortable attaching myself to, I'm not going to endorse. It doesn't mean I'm gonna go out against the person or do anything like that, but you can just do your thing and good luck. I, I I heard uh, President Preckwinkle say recently, very recently, in fact, that she would never run for mayor again because of the toll it took on her family. I look at the current mayor of Chicago, and I I have serious doubt, and it's just Mario doubt, but I have serious doubt that Mayor Lightfoot is going to run again. Although all signs point that she is, I just something in me is saying she may just be like, you know, I'm good. I don't need to do this. <laughs> Here we are, randomly selected, episode nine. Nine is a very important number in numerology. Yes, it is. You have the opportunity right now. Are you running for mayor <laughs> of the city of Chicago in the next election or the election after? <laughs> and do you need a vice mayor because I'm free on weekends? 
You know, you would have to be in any administration that I was a See, part that's of. That's just Martin. why I randomly selected this the best <laughs> podcast ever. Yes, that's right. I would be. What would you let like, what would be my job? Uh but I mean you would have your pick. I mean, where do you oh, well. where do you want to fit in? Okay, I mean, then I want streets and sand, because that's one of them city jobs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want a city job. Are you kidding me? I learned a long time ago. My 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 uncle used to be in charge of the streets of San Antonio oh, yeah? many, many, many years ago. Oh. Yeah, and he would always just kind of look at me. I was like, not my uncle, my cousin. He would just kind of look at me and be like, boy, get you a get city, you a city job. job. I'm like, yes, sir. No way I'm gonna be a garbage man. He's like, no, it's a sanitation worker. Yes. Like, oh. It yeah. sounds different, but it smells like garbage. It's well, like it pays well. So you can give me that? <laughs> well, yeah, it does. Or I will do, um, I couldn't be your press secretary because I would be <laughs> fired six <laughs> seconds after you hire me. That would be bad. <laughs> You know, maybe we should put yeah, that up. It'd be up to, refreshing. Oh, <laughs> I would be all four letter words. The worst press secretary in the history of Chicago. I think I'd like to be. I actually, you know what I would like to do? I would like to 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 be in charge of education, not the board of education, uh-huh. but like a czar. Okay. Because I would definitely go to Springfield and be like, listen. In order for this to work, we need to have an elected school board. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else is going to work. It has failed since Harold Washington. Yes. In yes. every way. But I would appreciate yes. this. So go ahead and say you're running. Well, I mean, who knows the future? And I, you know, that I am sounds not. so like you said to me many years ago. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I believe that, though. I, I don't do a lot of future planning. And not even in my life, I don't. Because doesn't exist we just have right here right now so i don't know what a year two years five years i'm just gonna go with the flow you already know if you do decide again you thought chance and yay was on your team (laughs) then oh good lord it's ironic they they were probably the most accurate predictors of who should who should have won they were in the mix to chicago rappers i love it (laughs) they win <laughs> I, I'm a big fan. I appreciate you. I'm glad that you agreed to do this. I, I It means a lot. It means a lot to the show. It means a lot to me that you're yeah. still as cool as you were that day in 2014 when you <laughs> allowed me to come off that stage <laughs> at, at, a, at a very good block party that I was having personally yes. and, a, and a stop and talk to you. It, it, it's been always been good. It's always good to have my radio wife on on, in front of a mic or on a phone or something. I appreciate yes. you so much. Thanks for being on Randomly Selected. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. You're the best. No bridges in Hyde Park. You safe. Yeah, for now. Your hand is safe anyway. You, <laughs> you ain't got to worry about me grabbing it. I think it's recovered yeah, by I, now. I was very <laughs> embarrassed by that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Dr. Enya, thank you so much. Truly appreciate you and... Uh, Thanks for letting me hurt your hand. You're the best. It's nine episodes. This is the ninth. The next episode, clearly, if you know your math, it's 10. 10 episodes, six months of doing this through COVID, out of COVID. Man, it's been fun. We have so much more to give you. We appreciate all of our guests that have been on the show and all our guests to come. Thanks, Eric. And thank you, Stefan. And thank you, Angela, too. Um, Our next show is the one I really, really am looking forward to. It's with Jacqueline Stewart, the head of arts and public life at the University of Chicago. She's also the host of Turner Classic Movies, Silent Sunday Nights. And she's newly minted as one of the people in charge of the Oscars Museum in Los Angeles. You really got to come and hang out with us, man. It's going to be good. That'll be our next episode of Randomly Selected. Until then, peace, power, and progress. See you soon.